I'm going to devote most of today to the problem of social objects. Um, things like claims, obligations, permissions, rights, laws, money, and so forth. Now, I'm going to present today a very, very abstract outline of an approach to those things. Um, some of it is uh, somewhat technical, but most of it is, uh, uh, I think, pretty easy to understand purely on the basis of the many pictures which I will be providing. Um, we will return to many of these topics later on in the semester, but I'm going to try and lay out the whole approach today. And um, so deontic entities are entities which involve something like an obligation or an oughtness or a requirement or an allowance, a permission or forbidding, uh, those kinds of things. And there is something called deontic logic, and I would like to think that what I'm going to say now is compatible with at least some variant of deontic logic, but I'm not going to be doing any deontic logic today. I'm also not going to be doing any ethics, um, which is probably a good idea since I'm clearly not qualified. Um, so there are obligations, some people say, which have to do with the very fact that you are a human being. Uh, for instance, parents are said to have obligations to raise their children. Um, and that they, they, then they can be said to have not fulfilled those obligations. Um, I'm not going to be addressing those kinds of ethical obligations. I'm interested in those kinds of obligations which come about because people perform certain acts in which they explicitly oblige themselves. Um, I think they are the basic kind of obligation for many, many things, including laws, um, including uh, the economics, uh, even including language itself, although we'll come back to that later on. Um, um, that, that's probably an exaggeration. So delete the little segment about language then. That's, the, the, the re relevance of language will become clear in a minute. All right. Now, as we saw a week ago, uh, the, there is a basic distinction in ontology between occurrence and continuance. Occurrence are things which occur, and if I press this button, then this thing will occur. Uh, and and uh, continuance are things which just are. And you can take photographs of continuance. You take videos of occurrence. And we, we have two different ways of keeping track of continuance and occurrence. So if we have a... Um, a warehouse, then we keep track of the items in the warehouse which are continuance, but we also keep track of the flows, the deliveries of items into the warehouse and the deliveries of items out of the warehouse. So stocks and flows are a reflection of this basic ontological distinction between continuance and occurrence. Now, very often I will talk not of occurrence, but of processes. Uh, so processes are the major family of occurrence, but there are other occurrences which are not processes, and the most important such family is temporal regions. The temporal regions unfold through time in just the same way that processes unfold through time. Processes are occurrences which involve participants, where temporal regions don't involve any participants. All right, so um, a musical score, is a, which will be a, an important example in what follows, although I probably won't ever mention it. A musical score is a continuance which enables uh, the occurrence of those occurrences we call performances. And the question is, how does the musical score enable a performance? And it will turn out that the musical score enables performance by consisting as in a set of instructions, which are deontic entities, which the members of the orchestra have the obligation to follow because they have a contract with the orchestra. All right, so continuance continue to exist through time uh, while they behave in certain ways. Um, and they are the same thing through that continuing to exist. So I lose molecules and I gain molecules continuously through my life, but I am still the same human being. From the very beginning of my existence 
to the very end of my existence, which will be after my death. So I believe that there is typically survival uh, of bodily death, but you survive as a corpse. Um, and then gradually the corpse will be disassembled for whatever reason. And then you no longer exist when your corpse has ceased to exist. Now, our current entities, unlike continuant entities, have temporal parts. Continuant entities have spatial parts, such as arms and legs and molecules. Um, and they unfold through their temporal parts, through the beginning, the middle, the end, and so on. And they exist only in whatever phase or stage they are in their unfolding. So this is the view that I defend. Um, so you are all continuants, you are substances or objects, and your life is a process. And you are all three-dimensional, and your life is a four-dimensional current, which involves unfolding through a temporal region, and at each stage, each point in that temporal region, you occupy a certain spatial region. And so there is a history of your life, which consists of a history of you, which is your life, which consists of everything that happens within the space-time worm which you occupy through the course of your life. All right, so we saw uh, a week ago the ontological sex step. So this is objects, such as people, in the uh, realm of universals. So the, there is the universal person, and then there are instances of universal persons, which are individual objects like you and me. And then there are qualities which are also continuums because your quality, with your shape or your height or your uh, skin color or your m mass, survive through time. They, they change their values as time goes on, but the qualities themselves, according to the view I'm defending, survive through time. This is probably, that, what I just said is probably not Aristotelian. Although it's not clear what view in this respect Aristotle held, but I wouldn't insist that he held the view I just stated. And then finally there are process universals and process instances. Your life is a process instance, and the universal life or life of an organism is the universal which those instances satisfy. So this is just repeating what I said. A week ago, this sextet is uh, encapsulated in this diagram um, of basic formal ontology, we have continuance which divide into objects and qualities, roughly speaking. And then we have occurrence. All of these are on the level of universals, or what Aristotle would call categories. And then we have instances of all of these things down here on Earth, or anyway. In the world of what happens and is the case. All right, so the universals and instances. Universals and instances. Now, and we have a relation of dependence, which holds between dependent continuance, such as qualities, and their bearers. And we also have a relation of dependence between occurrence and their participants. So your life is dependent on you. And then we have instances of all of these things. Um, all right, now I want to, first of all, introduce the idea of a specifically dependent continuum, and then introduce the idea of a realizable dependent continuum. And um, so qualities go here, as it says. But then there are other dependent continuums which uh, among which are functions, roles, and dispositions. So, what are realizable dependent continuants? Well, they are those dependent continuants which need to be realized in certain ways in order to exist at all. So your qualities, your mass, your temperature, your um, shape, your height, your weight, uh, and so forth, they just exist, and we can measure them any time we like, and, and we will be measuring the very quality which existed the last time we measured it. So we don't have to wait for your quality of mass to exist. It doesn't need to realize or manifest itself. It's already there. 
So it's, um, it's inert, if you like. And, and these things, the realizable dependent continuance, are ert, which is the opposite of inert. That is to say, they exist only in their manifestations, and the manifestations or realizations are not always necessarily occurring. So an example would be a nurse role. The role of being a nurse is manifested only during those times when the nurse is performing his nursey duties. And similarly, a pathogen, uh, a, a, um, a virus which infects people, is realizing its pathogen role only when it's actually doing some infecting. And similarly, uh, a, a, a piece of beef is, which has been prepared for hamburger production purposes, is performing, or, sorry, is realizing its role as food only when someone is actually eating it. Um, now, now, dispositions are similar. The disposition, th these are sometimes called powers or potentials or tendencies. Uh, the disposition of fragility manifests itself only when you break the fragile thing. It has the disposition to break, but it realizes the disposition only when it breaks. And some dispositions are never realized at all. So every sperm has the disposition to fuse with an egg, but very few of them succeed in ever realizing that disposition. Um, and then function, actually we may, we may want to say the function of a sperm is to, is to um, fuse with an egg. Functions are, are special kinds of dispositions. Basically they are the, those dispositions which exist because they were designed for, either by evolution through processes of selection or by having some kind of designer who designed a certain key to fit with a certain lock. Um, so, um, we have roles, which are primarily social kinds of things. The nurse role, the president role, the partner role. We have dispositions which are natural kinds of things, fragility and so, fragility and so forth. Um, and then we have functions, which are those very special kinds of naturally occurring dispositions, which have come to exist because of some process of design <coughs> or selection. All of these are realizable dependent continuance. And qualities are not realizable dependent continuance. In other words, they are non-realizable dependent continuance, which is the picture we have here. So the function of your heart is here. And the disposition of me to go bald is here. And my role as professor is here. And Obama's role as president is here, as you can see. Yeah. What about cases where the realization conditions are just like often there? So cases like, not like mass, but like weight, where things tend to have a standard weight on this planet, but they'd have a different weight in another. But we rarely encounter those planets, and so should we treat weights as so I would or not? Uh, off the top of my head, I would say that the weight that you have on this planet and the weight that you have on that other planet are different dispositions. And you only have this one, but you would have that one if you were there. And in the, in the intervening time, you'd have a completely different disposition. Uh, I guess you would have a very small weight. I think that's how it goes. Not as small as I'd like. <laughs> yeah. Can there be a case where something is under-realized and over-realized? Oh, of course, yeah. All of these things happen. How, so how would you define that? Um, the, um, the, so there is a, a general opposition in all the ontology work that we do between ontologies which describe the normal or natural or sometimes called a canonical case and then deviations from that normal or canonical case. The reason why we have those two kinds of ontologies is, because, let, let's take anatomy, 
Human anatomy is very complicated. I think it takes something like 600,000 nodes in the ontology to capture all of the parts of the human body. And there is an ontology which is uh, very large called the Foundational Model of Anatomy that, which does that job. But that's just for the normal body with two arms, two legs, five fingers, um, and so forth. Um, if, if you tried to capture all the deviations from that normal body in one ontology, it would have millions and millions of um, terms, and it would be unusable. And it would be unusable because the normal way of describing those deviant cases is to say how they differ from the normal cases. And so um, we have two kinds of ontologies, canonical ontologies and then ontologies which deal with important kinds of departures from canonical ontologies. And maybe even ontologies which deal with important kinds of departures from those important kinds of departures. Um, so we, we may have a typical case of diabetes, for instance, which would be dealt with in a diabetes ontology, but then there may be certain special cases of, I don't know, lunar diabetes. Diabetes on a spaceship, or I don't know what it would be. But that would be in, in another ontology, which would be one step removed further. Yep. I have a quick question about the disposition. So is the death disposition? Death? Yeah. There is, you have a disposition to die. Um, your death is, an, is going to be a process. Well, let's be very careful here. There are two meanings of death, at least. One is the dying process. And the other meaning is the, the death as the boundary within the dying process when death would be called if you were in an operating theater. Um, where, where you're dealing with a surgeon who is very good at calling death precisely. Um, so either death is a boundary of a process or it's a process. All right. So... Here are some examples of realizable dependent continuance. Well, we've seen most of these already. Um, now, the important thing is that realization depends on the relevant realizable dependent continuance. So, let's suppose it's my um, role to uh, slap the lazy students. Um, as, as like, it's part of my role. It's a duty that I have. Slap lazy students when they are falling asleep in class. Um, now let's suppose I also have a, 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 a hobby of slapping students just for fun. <laughs> then the process of realization of the duty to slap is a different process from the process of realization of slapping for fun. And that's captured by saying that this process of realization is specifically dependent on the underlying, underlying realizable dependent continuance, which in that case would be a role. Uh, another case for a disposition would be, let's suppose I have a disposition to go bald, which as a, a, an adult male I do, um, but that I cut my hair off. Then the end result, namely that I don't have any hair, is the same, but the process of cutting off my hair and the process of realizing the disposition of going, of going bald are clearly different processes. Even if, the, um, if it was the molecule for molecule same hair removal process, as you can imagine, if I have a very slow machine, um, I guess I have to cut at least one minute before the hair would fall out naturally if I'm going to have two processes. All right. And then the process of realization has to have the same bearer as the realizable. All right, so realization happens all over the place. Uh, so it happens in musical performance. It happens when we use language. It happens when we, when we uh, apply a therapy to a patient. Um, a disease itself is a disposition, and the course of a disease is a realization of that disposition. Um, the exercise of a role, we've already mentioned, the execution of a plan, we'll talk about later on, and so forth. So this is a very important ontological matter. The fact that we have 
realizable dependent continuance, which we can call attributes, so realizable attributes, like roles, like dispositions, which are realized or manifested in processes that we perform. So executions, expressions, exercises, applications, and so forth. Uh, now, we, we can think of a role as an externally grounded realizable uh, because it usually depends upon some social act. So the nurse has the nurse role because he has been employed as a nurse in a hospital by an employer. So that the employer would be the externally grounding factor. Um, and um, so dispositions are internally grounded realizable. So the reason I have the disposition to go bald is because I have a male type genome. Um, so that's something inside me in virtue of which the disposition exists. Now, having the uh, realizables at our disposal, we can deal with um, uh, a phenomenon which uh, is important to be able to deal with if we're going to deal with the architecture of reality properly. So I am, uh, sorry, John is a nurse. John is also a human being. Now, if we made a hierarchy of all the uh, types or universals that, or kinds or sorts that John could fall under, we would need to have human beings and nurses. And that seems to be inappropriate. It seems to be wrong to classify human beings and nurses within the same set of kinds. It would be a bit like classifying cars and red things within the same ontology because some cars are red. Uh, it would just be a, a somehow a, a, an overpopulating of the ontological landscape. And so what we do is we define what it is to be a nurse in terms of something else, uh, namely the nurse role. So to be a nurse is to have the nurse role. And you are a nurse only at certain times in your life. And now we have an ontology of roles, and we have an ontology of people. And there is no longer this problem of overpopulation. Just as with the car case, we would have an ontology of cars and an ontology of colors. And then we can, we can combine the, the ontological content uh, in order to deal with things like red cars. And so we define the ontological content of our understanding of roles with the ontological content of our understanding of people, and we can, we can build an ontology of uh, things like people who have the nurse role, people who have the president role. So Obama is a human being who has the president role. If we want to understand what it is for Obama to be the president, it's no good looking at, the, at Obama. You need to look at the office which Obama holds. And the office is on the role side. All right, so we've got roles, we've got dispositions. Functions are just special kinds of dispositions, and they won't be important for what we're doing today because, and this is an, a subject of debate, I believe that organisms do not have functions. Uh, there are some very special counterexamples, um, but generally speaking, organisms do not have functions. Anyone who believes in slavery might disagree with me. So if there's anyone who believes in slavery in the room, then they can give an argument why I'm wrong. Now, it may be that there are other arguments against my view that organisms do not have function. And if anyone holds any other argument, then they can speak now. What this means is that it is not Obama's function to be the president. It's not the secretary of your chess club's function to be the secretary. She wasn't born. To, she wasn't created by evolution or by whatever processes led to her, unless she's a robot. But robots can have functions. But organisms can't have functions. The parts of organisms, hearts, lungs, limbs, and so forth, all have functions. But organisms themselves do not have functions, unless you believe in slavery. Yeah. Just to clarify, you, by this you mean they don't have social 
No, I mean functions in the technical sense of dispositions which were designed or selected for by evolution. So a screwdriver has a function because it was designed to okay. perform something. A, um, a robot has a function. A, 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 um, a leaf on a tree has a function because it was selected uh, through a, the course of evolution to do this job. Uh, but an organism doesn't have a function. Now, the, the, the counter-example which I would accept is if you have a, a strain of bacteria which you grow artificially in a factory and then sell in the form of droplets to cure a disease, then that bacterium, which, which I guess is an organism, or, or anyway the, the droplet package would have a function, namely to cure that disease, because it was made for that reason. But organisms are not made for any reason. And certainly, Obama was not made to be president in this technical sense. Yep? Uh, what about like ecolog ecological niches? So, like predator, prey? Yes, so um, I believe in ecological niches, and there is in fact a place for ecological niches in this ontology. Um, they're called sites, um, and, and they are closely related to spatial regions, but different from spatial regions in, in uh, ways which um, we may go through at, at a later stage in this class. But I don't think they're relevant for the, st the, the study of these things today. Okay? All right, so... Deontic entities arise because of culture. And that's the view I hold. And so the question is, what is a culture? And um, f I'm, I'm not going to answer that question quite yet, but I am going to point out that th there seem to be three stages in the development of culture. Maybe now there are four. The first stage was the stage of culture before human beings acquired language. Now, we don't know much about those human beings, but we do know that they had tools, simple stone artifacts and the like, that they had leaders, that they performed a lot of things. And these are things which are never or rarely found in pre-human animals. That's the important thing. So culture, as I'm understanding it, is characteristic of human beings. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. So there was culture before there was language. But when language came along, a whole new set of possibilities for culture arose. Culture became enriched in a, a whole range of ways. To the degree that some people, and John Searle, who will be uh, addressed later on today, is probably a good example. Michael Dummett, I referred to a week ago. Some people think that culture is a linguistic phenomenon. That culture, everything in culture is what it is in virtue of the fact that we have language. Um, so Searle doesn't quite think that, but he certainly thinks that all the interesting things in culture... Uh, rest upon the existence of language. Now, initially, language was confined to speech, and you did have poetry at that stage. But it wasn't poetry in the sense that we have it today. It was poetry which was communicated by professional singers or reciters of poetry who used to copy each other, and the copying process was somewhat unreliable. Um, but when you have writing and printing, and now you have... Uh, central processing units, which can allow you to do word processing and many other things. Uh, then you have a, yet another level of enrichment. But then you can have things like science. Science, which allows people to take the ideas that somebody proposed generations ago and test them for validity today. And before you had writing, that kind of testing of hypotheses was practically speaking impossible. So you have geometry, you have logic, you have many things which were very difficult to conceive of as having existed before the existence of writing. All right, uh, so in, one, in, in stages one and two, everything in culture had to be stored in human brains. At least that's... Uh, they, there's some cultures stored in the stone artifacts, some cultures stored in clay cave paintings, but apart from those kinds of cases, 
everything had to be stored in human brain. Um, some people argue that this is a, a reason why grandmothers exist. Because from an evolutionary point of view, human beings should survive only if they are fertile. Because they could waste energy. And so evolution would have selected against um, populations with infertile people. For instance, postmenopausal women and postgynopausal men, if there is something like it. Is it called a gynopausal? Anyway, there is, some people think there is a, me a m male menopause. Uh, but grandmothers do exist. And the argument is made that grandmothers exist as a store of memory so that they can tell the, uh, the young humans how life was like in past ages. And so the, a lot of the valuable memory which is needed to keep the top population alive is transmitted through, through grandmothers. Um, but now in level three, culture can be stored in external memories, not just in paintings in caves, but also in uh, videos and, uh, and so forth. And dictionaries. Dictionaries are very important, as we will see. All right, any questions? Now, the, 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 I'm, I'm very impressed with the work of the School of Thought, uh, which is um, uh, most clearly represented in the work of Richardson and Boyd, for instance, in their book, Not by Genes Alone, which is basically a biological or evolutionary approach to human culture. And the crucial feature about humans is that they have cumulative cultural evolution. That is to say, the culture that you have in one population can be enhanced in the successor population because there is something like learning. There is teaching. So the older members of the population can teach, either by example or by actual uh, deliberate teaching, how the younger members of the population should behave. Now, you do get a small amount of this teaching within some non-human organisms, but the, the idea of cumulative cultural evolution is restricted to humans, and, and humans manifest it fantastically. So we have clothing, we have furniture, we have air conditioning, we have overhead projectors, and animals didn't have any of those things, and they didn't have anything even close to any of those things. Um, and now, one argument is that the vehicle for the advance of culture um, is, uh, in many cases, perhaps in most cases, lingu language. Language is certainly very important for the advance of culture. That's why the speed with which culture accumulates goes, goes up very rapidly when language enter, enters into the picture. Now, I, th there's one set of issues that I have with the Richardson-Boyd approach, which is that they see this as a matter of information transfer. So the older uh, human being performs a certain act, eating with um, chopsticks, for instance, and the younger human being sees the older human being performing this act, and imitates it. And they see this as a way in which information affects individual behavior because the younger person sees the older person, information comes into the retina, through, through the optic nerves, into the brain of the younger person, which they can then use in order to uh, copy the behavior of the older person. Now, there's a, a trivial sense in which that captures a, a grain of truth in what goes on when people imitate other people. But I think to treat this as a purely, purely a matter of information flow is, is to miss something. And um, th so there is a parallel omission also in many attempts by computer scientists to understand business or economics or law or any of these other activities which involve deontic elements. 
Um, so this is a, a very famous book called Document Engineering from some years back, um, which defines a document as a purpose, purposeful and self-contained collection of information. Now, purposeful could mean that the information is put there in the document for a reason or purpose. It could also mean that the document has a purpose, namely to guarantee a loan when you give the bank the title deeds to your house. But then I would argue that the document serving that kind of deontic purpose is not just the collection of information. And the, the, the key, so this is where deontics kicks in. This is the key challenge. How do we understand how a document can serve a deontic purpose? And I, so I would say, um, so the, 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 actually it becomes clearer still here. So this is from the book by Glushko. Business collaborations, uh, for instance, between online credit card authorization services and which verify the charges of the, uh, uh, and so on. He sees them as internet information exchanges. Now that's a bit like seeing a, uh, a fight between two drunken uh, thugs at midnight as an exchange of bodily contacts. You're missing something if you see this kind of thing merely as information exchange. All right, now what you're missing is twofold, I think. One is what I'm going to focus mainly on, the dimension of sanction. Punishment. Um, and the other dimension, which I am much less confident about, I, I'm, I'm sure it's important, and I will say a few things about it, is what I'm going to call the dimension of bodily skill, but that's, that captures only part of it. it. Maybe it includes the dimension of ability to react to pain, which is going to be involved also in the sanction component. But anyway, I, I'm going to talk about these two. All right, so very briefly on sanction, and then we'll return to sanction for the main part of this session. So Boyd has a paper um, called Coordinated Punishment of Defectors Sustains Cooperation and Can Proliferate When Rare. Now, the, the target that we are trying to address, and this must be about the seventh time I've describe this target in a completely different way from all the other six times, but it's the same target, is how did human cooperation evolve? So just think of the human cooperation evolved to put a man on the moon. Uh, they say it cost, I don't know, several billion man hours of people involved in many, many different ways to achieve that end. How did you get there? And one answer is, People were forced to cooperate by war. So other people were attacking them, and if they didn't cooperate, then they would uh, be annihilated. And, but that would imply that the warlike people would, would over... Which may be true, actually. Um, but, but there is some evolutionary evidence that punishment on, on the level of smaller societies could not have survived. And this paper is providing evidence that under reasonable assumptions, um, punishment of defectors, punishment of people who break the rules of the society, can survive as a strategy, a, a survival-able um, strategy, to sustain cooperation and to extend the corporate cooperation uh, so that the society becomes not merely able to survive, but actually able to grow and grow. And so punishment would spread through society in that way. So um, uh, I, I'm, going to ha I'm going to put these slides on the web so you can read this. Uh, and you can even read the paper. Uh, but basically, the idea is that cooperation started because people started to sanction people who broke the rules. They started to sanction cheaters. Now, we'll come back to sanction very soon. Let's talk a little bit now about bodily skill 
Um, so if Glushko is right that documents are just collections of information, and if the passage from Boyd and Richardson, which I gave earlier, is right, that culture is just information, then in principle you ought to be able to transmit all the culture in me into a robot or into a clone of me so that I could survive bodily death in another way. So this is, the, this is an idea that people like to uh, toy with, that we could put all of human knowledge into a digital form and transmit it down a wire and then reactivate it in some other entity. And so the idea, um, the, 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 the argument against this idea is as follows. Imagine a five-stone weakling having his brain loaded with the knowledge of a champ champion tennis player. He goes to serve in his first match, and then, wham, his arm falls off. Now, what that means is that the information in the brain, which we, certainly if this is conceived in roughly digital form, and the body capacities that make that information the information that it is, Need to be need to develop together in the way that human beings develop their informational and their bodily capacities together as they develop as uh, through childhood and adolescence and so forth. So um, I think that what we develop, what we learn, the bodily skills that we develop as we go through time, include bodily skills to associate certain kinds of painful experiences with certain kinds of rule breaking, with the fear of certain kinds of sanctions. Now, I'm, I don't have a coherent handle on, on this part of the story, uh, but I, I think you get the idea that there is a part of the story which involves the sensitiveness of a human organism existing in a certain kind of culture to certain kinds of sanctions or threats of sanctions. And this sensitiveness brings it about that that human being follows the rules even if they are never sanctioned. Now, an, a, a good example would probably be traffic behavior. So you, you approach a green light and you drive at some speed, obviously, um, in order to get through the green light. Now, there are idiots and and, and Violent people who, in, in, not only in Italy, who, <laughs> who, don't, who think that red light just, is just a warning. <laughs> you should be careful in case there's somebody coming in the other direction. There are some of those people, not in Buffalo, but... <laughs> now, but you go anyway. Why do you go? Why do you think that 99.9% .9 of the people driving on the road are going to follow the law because you know that they have the same kind of sensitivity to sanction that you have. And the sanction here would be manifold. First of all, there would be all the paperwork to do if there was a crash. Secondly, there would be the actual bodily damage to your car, which is the most important part. Then there would be the bodily damage to you. And then there would be an insurance uh, answer. So of going to jail if you're drunk. Um, so people are sensitive to sanctions in a massively complex and subtle way. And it's because of that that, the, that we can drive a car. All right. Um, now there is another dimension to this, which is um, the, what some people call embodiment or... Um, um, I've forgotten the analytic philosophical term for this. But anyway, and Andy Clark's book Being There is a good manifestation of it. So we don't rely merely on the information in our brains and messages coming in through speech. Um, we also rely on the maps and models and tools and books and so on so forth that are, uh, surround us. Like extended cognition. Extended cognition, exactly. Um, so, as he puts it, we act so as to simplify cognitive tasks by leaning on the structures in our environment. Now, I think that what I'm talking about with the sanction business, and remember the sanction business is going to be interlaced with the traffic sign 
and the road markings. So you will see road markings as being sanction-fused. You won't see them consciously. You will lean on the traffic signs in the environment in guiding your behavior because you, you apprehend those traffic signs as part of a complex environment. Well, this is your niches again. Um, which is loaded with sanction possibilities. Um, which is why you sometimes notice speed limit signs. And you notice them in proportion to the degree that you worry about the possibility of sanction. All right. So there are two kinds of knowledge. And I, by knowledge, I mean not just knowledge that, not just propositional knowledge, but also skills, knowledge how, know-how. One is knowledge which can be transferred as information through a wire, and the other is knowledge that rests on um, niches, niche structures in the environment, which we flow along with because we've grown up in, the, in that environment and learned that certain things are associated with sanctions and so forth. All right, now, co to understand cooperation, we need to understand obligations. That's what it says here. And so the question is, where do obligations fit in the BFO ontology? Are they continuance? Are they occurrence? Are they realizable dependent continuance? And so forth. That's the question. So we have this picture. They're certainly not independent continuance because independent continuance are made of molecules, roughly speaking. They have mass. They, um... Are they specifically dependent continuance? Well, are they things like qualities? No, because you can have the obligation to collect the money from the bank without ever realizing the obligation to collect the money from the bank. So are they realizable dependent continuance? Well, they, they could be roles. Or they could be dispositions, functions we can rule out. Maybe there are maybe there are other kinds of realizable dependent continuance, but the best candidates at the moment seem to be roles and dispositions. Now you have the obligation to collect some money from the bank. What that mean what that means is that you play what in the terminology of these things is called the obligor role. There is the obligor and the obligee. I am the obligee. You promised me that you would collect the money from the bank. You are the obligor because you have the obligation. I have the claim. Now, I believe that when you promise me that you will collect the money from the bank, you are indeed, from that point on, someone who bears this particular obligor role. I don't have any problem with that. And I bear the obligee role. But I don't think that bearing that role or talking about bearing that role, explains what it is for you to be under the obligation. So we need to, so the role that you play and the obligation that you have are ontologically different. And I don't believe that we can explain the obligor role. Sorry, I don't believe that we can explain the obligation in terms of the obligor role. I think that the order of explanation goes the other way around. We explain the obligor role by explaining what an obligation is. And so the role is not yet going to be a good candidate for where obligations go. Now, that was somewhat tortuous, but does anyone have any questions? You get the basic idea? All right, so are obligations dispositions? So if I tell you I'm going to shoot you unless you bring the money back uh, from the bank by midnight, uh, then you probably have a disposition to go and get the money. But I don't think you're under an obligation to go and get the money. Uh, certainly there are scenarios like the one I just described where you wouldn't be under an obligation even though you would have the disposition. Uh, one scenario is that you're an FBI mole and you're going to go to the bank and get the money, but you're only pretending to do that because the man with the gun has threatened you, 
because you're doing it in order to be able to catch the man with the gun in a sting operation. So being disposed to go to the bank and get the money and being obliged to get, go to the bank and get the money are two different things, it seems to me. And so dispositions won't work either, it seems to me. Or if the disposition does work, we need to say a lot more about that special kind of disposition, which is an obligatory disposition, and that means we still haven't really done our job of describing what an obligation is. Yes? Um, it seems like disposition isn't going to work, too, because they're all specifically inherent, right? Yes, I so... Can, I can have an obligation without having any disposition to perform it. That is an interesting question. Um, we'll come back to that question. So you're, we're going to be dealing with that. I, the, the, what, the case that I thought you were going to raise is the case where you have an obligation to pay me $10, but you, uh, you transfer your, that obligation to someone else. Um, but we'll come, come back to that case also later on. All right, now, the next thing we need to talk about is mutual dependence. So we've been talking about qualities, dispositions, roles as being dependent on their bearers. But sometimes qualities, dispositions, and roles can be mutually dependent on each other. And an example is a key and a lock. So this key has the disposition to unlock this lock. This lock has the disposition to be unlocked by this key. And the two dispositions are mutually dependent on each other. Neither of them would exist unless the other one exists. And you have the same kind of um, uh, mutual dependence here. The husband role is mutually dependent on the wife role, or at least it used to be in the good old days. And, um, I'm, and uh, a doctor, the doctor role is dependent on the patient role. Um, the host role is dependent on the pathogen role. And there are many other kinds of mutual dependence relations of this sort. And they're all role uh, cases. Um, so we have the key, we have the lock, but now if we think about the key and the lock, this, the key doesn't just have the disposition to open this lock, it has the disposition to open every lock which is calibrated in the same way as this lock. And similarly, the lock doesn't just have the disposition to be opened by this key, it has the disposition to be opened by every shape identical key. And so what we're dealing with here is not specific dependence, so that it's, it's what we call generic dependence. The, the lock has to be opened by this key or by some similar key. Now that's different from specific dependence. My headache is specifically dependent upon my head. I cannot transfer my headache to some similarly shaped organism. It's specific to me. But there are things which are generically dependent. And a good example would be, well, these, the claim and obligation are mutually dependent. Uh, so this is still an example of specific mutual dependence. But if John signs a contract, then it could be that somebody buys the contract and then that somebody acquires the claim on Mary which was agreed to in the original contract, John releases himself of the obligation by getting somebody to agree to uh, buy his obligation. No, sell. Anyway, whatever you do with obligations. So that the other person has it. And then you've moved the dependence relation from the original signer of the contract to be someone else, which means that that dependence relation, that obligation, would be a generically dependent continuum. So... These are cases, the key case and the contract which can be transferred case are both examples of mutual generic dependence. And, um, and now, so generic dependence is distinguished from specific dependence as follows. My headache depends specifically upon my head. My temperature depends specifically on me. But this gene sequence depends on some molecule with a certain structure, but as we well know, it, through processes of copying, gene sequences can be uh, transferred from one molecule to another. Um, and similarly, when you copy a PDF file from one laptop to another laptop, then you copy the same pattern, 
from one place to another. It's the same PDF file. If you destroy your original laptop, provided you copied it first, then the PDF file survives because the PDF file is not specifically dependent on any laptop. It is only generically dependent on some magnetic memory store. So generic dependence is, um, is an, an extra element in VFO. We have specifically dependent continuance, namely realizable and non-realizable, and we have generically dependent continuance. And information entities like PDF files uh, are the, the typical examples of generically dependent continuance. And a, a contract, QA information concept, content entity, is certainly a generic dependent continuous entity. What we have to decide is, is an obligation a generic dependent continuous entity? And I, I, will, um, I, I will, in the end, say no, but by going through this, uh, discussion, we acquire more of what we need. Um, all right. So, where do claims and obligations go? Well, claim and obligation are going to be mutually dependent upon each other, but they don't seem to fit under any of these boxes in a, a way which is satisfying. But we can do roles. We can talk about the ro obligor role of John when he makes a promise to Mary and the obligee role of the obligee obligee obli obli I know it's obligor because I uh, I listened to the relevant YouTube video. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I didn't I didn't do that one. I figured I knew how to pronounce obligee or obligee obligee. Anyway, so we can do all of that, but we still don't know where obligation goes. Now, something else we can do, is if John makes a promise to Mary, if John really makes a promise to Mary, rather than just uttering words uh, because he's trying to humiliate Mary, or for whatever reason, if he really makes a promise, then he has the disposition to perform on the promise. All right, so the assumption is that John really makes a promise to Mary, and John acquires the disposition to perform and Mary who, uh, Mary, who knows about the promise, because a real promise has to be made in the presence of the promisee who registers the promise. Mary acquires a, a disposition to monitor. So the disposition will be of varying strengths. If she really trusts John, then she may not monitor very much at all. But eventually she's going to wonder about whether he actually did what he promised to do. So there is something on the side of Mary which we, we can think of as a disposition to monitor. So we have, now we can say this much. There is a disposition pair, and these are somewhat mutually dependent in the sense that John's disposition to perform is going to be somewhat dependent upon Mary's disposition to monitor, at least in terms of the timing or of the expense of the present that he's going to, that he's promised to buy her, that sort of thing. Um, and certainly the obligor and obligi role are mutually dependent. You can't have one without the other. All right, so where is the obligation? Let's just talk about BFO first. So BFO means basic formal ontology. Formal means domain neutral. So formal ontology applies to every domain. And all of these things are domain neutral. They can be a, a found in every domain. But these things, things like monitoring and being obliged and contracts and so forth, are specific to the human domain. We don't find those in physics or in cosmology or in any of the other scientific domains that people talk about. Now, so the question could be, does obligation belong here or here? Is it part of BFO or is it not part of BFO? And I hope it's obvious, so this is domain specific, it's obvious that um, claim and obligation do not belong in the formal domain. They belong in the material domain. That the more interesting question is, 
do we already hear this is all a buffer that might be relevant to our purposes. There's nothing else. There are all the regions and, and some odd bits, but this is all we have to work with. Do we have enough to work with here by making definitions, just as we could define obligor and obligee if we had obligation to work with? Do we have enough here to get obligation out of this? Or do, are we going to need to add something new in order to uh, deal with obligations? And my answer to that question is, no, we already have enough here to be able to do a good job with obligation. Um, now, I'm going to change the uh, topic um, to give another example of a phenomenon which I think is very relevant to culture and obligation, but which I think is more easy to understand. So before I deal with that, do we have any questions? Yep. He, he is next. Well, if you go back to the previous slide, the... This? Well, um, either of them is fine. So, in the disposition to perform that John acquires in virtue of having made a sincere promise, I think that case is probably not the one you want to use, because he could make an insincere promise and still take on an obligation, right? But not have any disposition. So, I don't, yeah, so, okay, I don't think yeah. you have the resources yeah. there yet for anything like yeah, so I agree that there are scenarios in which somebody has acquired an obligation but has no disposition to perform. Yeah. But promising is not one such case. Because prom if you promise and you have no disposition to... Sorry, if you use the word I, words I promise and then you do not have a disposition to perform, then you haven't really promised. You've just used the word. So if I if I say, Mary, I'll go to lunch with you, and I have only the desire to humiliate Mary and make her eat lunch by herself, I think I still have an obligation to go eat lunch with Mary, even though I'm a totally evil person who's not going to fulfill that obligation. Right? I have no disposition. I haven't acquired that at all in uttering it, but yet I uttered it. And so I, another way, Mary has a kind of claim on you. And yeah. And you said you would. Doesn't, it's not like that claim goes away just because. Okay, so I. Um, I think that I agree with that. I mean, maybe we could say yeah. other people have, like Mary's going to have a disposition to punish yeah. me, and so we can we can get something like that here, but yeah. I don't think you'll have enough yet. Oh, I'm sure we don't have enough here, but w the question is whether we have the tools here, which will be sufficient. And what you're suggesting is that we don't actually need to assume this. And um, so I think I probably would agree with Brian's suggestion that Mary certainly has a claim. But similarly, Mary might just be um, unjustifiably claiming all kinds of things of other people that, that impose no obligations claiming, on them. Claiming in the sense of using the claim language and yeah. having a claim are two different things again. Well, she might have the disposition to claim, but that imposes no obligation upon others. Um, so we'll, we'll, I think everything I'm going to say will still work, even given what you say. Okay. Um, all right. So let's talk about language. Um, so each, we can all speak English. We all have a disposition to speak English, and that disposition is twofold. On the one hand, it is the disposition to create English sentences, both by writing and speaking, and to understand uh, the English sentences that are created by our fellows. That's one side, so the creation side. But the other side of our uh, linguistic competence is the ability to do all of those things correctly. In other words, speaking English means being able to put words together in broadly correct ways. Now, what is correct will differ in different communities and even at different times of day. Um, but there is a notion of correctness in every linguistic community. There is no linguistic community which does not have this correctness competence. The speed at which people articulate 
utterances in the relevant language is not so important, the frequency with which they do it. But the correctness is important. So when I talk about competence, I'm interested in this correctness factor. Um, and notice that in some communities, speaking incorrectly may be correct. Um, I don't think I need to elaborate on that. But um, All right. So I want now to define a language as the sum total of linguistic competences of all the users of the language in this sense. Now, this means that the English language is going to contain islands where the competencies vary in different ways. Sometimes even the rules governing those competencies conflict. But that's not a problem because no one thinks that a language is a homogeneous uh, affair in any case. Everybody knows that two people can speak English and yet they speak it quite differently. Um, so this is actually a good result. This does justice to the existence of dialects and so forth. Now, one objection to this definition is that it looks as if it's circular because we're defining a language in terms of linguistic somethings and that looks as if it's not a good definition. Now, I agree. <laughs> I don't think that there is any way around this. So we can try and get around it by defining those things which are linguistic utterances in terms of which part of the brain is responsible for producing them, which parts of the uh, anatomy of the throat and so on are responsible for producing them. So we define speech, then we can define writing in similar ways without using words like linguistic or language. Uh, but I don't think we need to go to that trouble. I think we all understand um, that this definition, even though it looks circular, does add something to our understanding of the word language, if it's correct. And I say it's something like the sum total of the competencies. Um, I would like it to be identical with the sum total of the competencies. I think it would be, that would be the most ontologically satisfactory account. But uh, if you want to say language, a language is that abstract entity which satisfies all the normal things that we would want to say about a language. For instance, that it has many speakers, that it originated in the 16th century, that it derived from high German and so on. And which is patterned in ways which correspond exactly to the sum total of linguistic competences of its linguistic community, then I would be happy with an approach along those lines. All right. Now, one, if this only works for natural languages. It doesn't work for programming languages and so forth. I don't know of any better account. Um, I think it gives exactly the right account of things like dialects, and it gives an account of why dictionaries are important. It even gives an account of the uh, role of the Académie Française in relation to the French language. Namely, that it doesn't really make any difference what they say because people will still continue to say bulldozer. Yeah? Uh, so, I'm a little unclear on why we should think of competence as a definition. Uh, competence, I, I think I'm on board that it can be a kind of realizable entity, but the abilities I have don't much from the, the disposition. ability to watch a boring movie or something, but not the disposition to watch. I mean, it just seems like, like it's a broad, competence is a broader class. All right, so I have, I would really like to add the term capability into BFO, somewhere between function and disposition. I really think that there is a gap there. But I have tried and tried and tried, and I cannot find a way of defining capability. Now, if you think you have a good definition, then you will win a reasonably large prize. Um, <laughs> Um, you'll find it's a hard challenge. Yep? Yeah, but what about natural languages that we don't speak anymore, that we still have to decipher? Uh, in that case, uh, this would account for this kind okay, of... Okay, fine. So I will, I, will add, um, I will add a clause. <laughs> <laughs> so does he get a small prize? <laughs> 
No, no, no. But he, this is his prize. <laughs> <laughs> this is. I guess I should save that. Um, any more? Okay, so the, this is the area of the United States where um, people will say, are you coming with, instead of are you coming with us? Uh, so are you coming with is German, kommen Sie mit. Um, that's also where many Germans were settled. Um, and then there is one with crayfish, crawfish. Crawdad. Uh, so all of these people are speaking English. And some of them say crawdad. Uh, this is the classification of the Romance languages. So, um, anyway, this is just designed to illustrate that there are fuzzy boundaries between different linguistic communities, and therefore also fuzzy boundaries between the languages, which reflect the competences of those different communities. All right, now the point I want to make is that the linguistic competence, which is the ability to speak English, is not just a linguistic competence. So just as learning the meanings of the traffic signs which are guiding you when you drive is more than just learning about these pretty shapes and what they mean in sense of information, you're also learning the sanctions which go hand in hand with them. And you are learning those sanctions not as intellectual matters of fact, but as controls on how you behave, which become embedded in your driving habits. So they become unconscious controls on how you behave. Um, so when you learn the rules of language, or when you learn, when you acquire the ability to speak a language like English, then you also acquire to some degree, an ability to communicate with other English speakers, which doesn't just mean that you can un understand them, it also means that you know how to behave politely or uh, with the appropriate speed of and aggressiveness of response in given society. So you won't, won't in given context, sorry, you won't always speak in the same way, you will speak differently according to context, and that is a very complicated collection of competences which we might call communicative, communicative competences. You also learn how to use language to persuade people with or without associated weaponry. Um, so, um, arguing, for instance, uh, cajoling, flattery. Um. You also acquire the ability to use language all by yourself to do, to do thinking. And you... Uh, Acquire the ability to exchange information. So not just to communicate in socially acceptable ways, but also to communicate in informationally successful ways. Um, and these kinds of dispositions are spread, again, unevenly across the entire community. So that you can probably communicate successfully with people in the next neighboring town, but you may have a great difficulty if you move to Calabria and speak to the English-speaking population there, which would be double uh, challenge. Um, but then, most importantly, you, have, you acquire the ability to use language to bring about changes in the world. Now, by threatening people, by um, cursing people, uh, which is, in, in Africa, a very powerful way of using language to bring about changes in the world, in certain parts of Africa. Uh, by putting spells on people, by um, uh, promising things to people, and so forth. And this is the realm where deontic entities come into play. So, if we say that deontic entities of a certain sort come into being because of language use, this does not mean that those deontic entities are linguistic entities any more than um, a, um, a threat which you perform and which makes somebody behave in ways which lead to mass slaughter is a purely linguistic 
phenomenon. So the ling language, in other words, goes way beyond just speaking and writing and reading and listening to include many other kinds of activities and many other kinds of phenomena, particularly of the deontic sort. So, and there are competences governing those non-linguistic sorts of things which go hand in hand with languages. Now, the first philosopher to get some kind of appreciation for this uh, was almost certainly Thomas Reed, who recognized that there are what he called social acts, of which promising is a good example. And when you promise something to somebody, then you, you create what Reed called a miniature civil society. You create something new, a social fact, or um, something which is brought about purely by the act of language use. And so Reed distinguished between two kinds of acts, social acts and solitary acts. Solitary acts are thinking or, or speaking to yourself or going for a walk or by yourself. But then there are some acts which are essentially social um, in that they must be directed to some other person. Now, praying may be one such act if you count God as a person. Uh, but most of the acts that you're interested in here are the kinds of acts which are nowadays called speech acts, promising, warning, commanding, threatening, and so forth. Aristotle didn't re recognize that there were these other kinds of ways of using language. For Aristotle, as Reed himself points out, acts of using language are always for descriptive purposes, for purposes of expressing propositions. So if I say... Um, what time is it, then I am really saying, I, I'm saying something factual. I do not know what the time is, and I would like you to tell me what the time is. Um, so you turn the question into two assertions. All right, now let's go back to um, promising. Um, a Reedian view of, of obligation Oh, sorry, a reading, a reading view of the dispositions brought about by promising, and we'll ignore your issues with this. And if I seem to be ignoring them to the very end of the class, it's your, you are obliged to remind me. So, John promises to Mary that he will do X, and this gives rise to initial dispositions on Mary's part to monitor John's behavior relative to the performance, eventually to evoke a claim. But then when she realizes he's not going to perform on his promise, then she starts to be liable to blame, shame, or punish him. So this is just between John and Mary. Now... This would be, I think, a miniature civil society, and it gets a, gr a big part of what is involved when John really promises to Mary that he's going to do X and then fails to perform. But I think it misses something. I think, and this is part of what the two of you are getting at when you talk about John making a sham promise. Namely, this is not just for up to Mary and John. John and Mary exist in a society of linguistic, uh, linguistically able fellows who know what the rules are. And the rules for using promising language are that you realize your promise, that you perform. And the rules for failure to perform are that you get blamed. Now, Mary may not care, but there are many other members of the society who are liable to care, or to care at least in the sense that if they hear John make a promising uh, gesture in the future, they will ignore it, or they will raise their eyebrows and sniff. Um, so the blame, shame, punish, sanctioning may be affected by, by Mary, or it may be affected by Mary's friends or by onlookers, or by Mary's boss, or by someone who is 
involved in the scenario enough to know that John is not to be trusted. Now, the fact that John lives in a society like that, or we all live in a society like that, that's why we have the institution of promising in the society, means that we do not use the I promise to lightly. So some of us do, but those, those people eventually get, little by little, ostracized. They, we recognize who they are. Uh, so this is the, the, the modified Reedian view, that to have an obligation is to do all of this and to live in a society where this happens, not every time, but often enough to make a difference. And now uh, the, the grand thesis is that if you do not live in a society in which this occurs, then you do not live in a society in which there are obligations. So if no one cares about performance, then there is no such thing as obligation in that society. And that is sort of an empirical hypothesis. Uh, but you can try and think of a counterexample. Yep? Well, here's a reverse one. So let's say that we lived in a society not that didn't have any um, checking and monitoring and promising, but that actually fetishized it way too much. So I'm thinking of like Puritan society, yep. and now we think that Hester Prynne has this obligation to wear the scarlet letter according to the dispositions of the townsfolk. But I, I think today we wouldn't say she has any such obligation. And so you're doing it again. You're, 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 both of I your doing? objections were... Well, what if we lived in a society in which X? I guess I'm, I'm trying to get this down, is, what, what's the nature of the obligation to issue here? Is it moral? Is it civil? Is it's it... not moral. Okay. <laughs> it's core obligation. It's core obligation? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I'm thinking about how we're up in the code. Yeah. It seems to me like, sure, it doesn't have any pull on us or anything like that. There's no disposition for anyone in our yeah. society to blame, shame, or punish someone who but it seems like it exists. It's a set of directives or instructions or something like that. And even directs. Good. Gives, gives, it, gives Good. examples of Good. So, what to do if someone breaks the rule yeah. and whatnot. And it seems to me like, if anything, yeah, there, if, in order for obligations to be effective in some way, there need to be these dispositions. But it seems to me like that's a set of rules, a set of laws, a set of obligations, something like that. So I agree that, that I, I'm going to be talking later on about planning. And I make a distinction between a plan specification, which is the written plan, and a plan, which is the written plan as embraced by somebody as his plan, which he will then realize. Now, the, the, the Hammurab, Hammurabi is it? Hammurabi is correct, yeah. exists as a code specification, but it doesn't exist as a code. And only if it exists as a code is it associated with obligations to conform. And this explains also why core obligation, as I'm calling it, is not ethical, because it could be that, there, that we live in a society in which there, is, there are legal codes which have nothing to do with ethics, but we still have the obligation to conform to those codes. Yep? Um, when I make a promise to myself, which has me monitor myself and then has a disposition... You can't make a promise to yourself. Uh, really? I'm inclined to agree, but uh, can you say more? Um, so, we would probably sanction you if you went around telling people that you promised to yourself, because we would think that you were uh, not really in command of the English word promise. What if I was um, an addict who promised myself not to continue to abuse the substance? Um, in some way, raising the assurance and to myself, maybe. Okay, Pete, I think that there is a way in which that kind of talk works, even, even is effective, but that's because other people are listening who, who are disposed to sanction in just these ways, and you, you realize that this is a way of getting people to monitor your conformance to your own quasi-promise. So, um, like in an AA meeting or something, yeah, they, exactly. they have to know. Yeah. Um, I, okay, so I thought you said a minute ago that not in every case would you be sanctioned by others. Um, I thought I took that to mean something. Maybe I misheard. I took that to mean something like they didn't have to know. But you're saying the others, other people would have to know. So it's just that I'm in a society. I 
I think there are cases where every case would be such that it would lead to sanctions. So that's why in a court of law, people keep records of everything that people say. So legal processes have lots of record keeping, precisely because they want to be able to sanction reliably if someone tells a lie. Um, but then there are other cases where um, the, there is no possibility of sanction because the, the phenomenon occurred in private. So I, th there are lots of promises which occur when uh, two people um, are in, engaging in sexual banter preliminary to something else, uh, and they make promises to each other. But they, they are necessarily not, well, maybe YouTube um, kinds of cameras would be confusing the matter a little bit, but gen generally there's no one watching. And at least not yet. Maybe the universities will institute rules where there has to be a YouTube video of every sexual conversation. Um, generally, today, it's private between the two people, which is why there are so many uh, disputes about which obligations were incurred. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, so I have a question about this, which is really a question about how the, the whole ontology project is working. Uh, I, I don't see quite how this is dealing with vagueness. So you made some comments about vagueness last class. You suggested, well, when we get to a, a vague case, we can go down to some sort of finer partition, yeah. and we'll see where the vagueness is arriving. Yeah. So, so why do we have to say, you know, no, you can't promise yourself. Just no, right? It seems like we want to say, well, sort of. Uh, we can see when we look at the nested levels of granularity or whatever that that uh, these obligations are really these big complexes of, of dispositions. And when we go down uh, and examine a promise to yourself, we see, well, you sort of have a disposition to do it. You have a disposition to blame yourself and feel guilty if you don't do it. Um, it's, it's, you know, plenty of the ingredients are there. It seems like we want to just say, well, it's a big case and it's a, you know, good enough family resemblance to the promising practice that it's a, we don't really have to say anything definitive about it. So I think that um, if the, the approach can give an account of a case like this in terms of what... in it, the earlier terminology we might call the canonical cases, the cases where things work smoothly, then that suggests that the account has a certain power. Um, we can't perform the zooming trick which we could perform in the biological cases where we can find out that something which is abnormal on the level of whole organisms is actually perfectly predictable when you look at underlying, for instance, DNA. Uh, but we can do something which I think is equally productive, which is that we can look at the kinds of modifications that a, a given phenomenon, self-obliging, acquiring an obligation through performing an act, uh, the, the, the different modifications that that kind of phenomenon can undergo. And I will give you a list in a minute. So I had that ready just for your question. Um, however, I think, I think that all dispositions are liable to involve a certain degree of vagueness. Uh, so let's suppose you have a really well-designed, simple glass vase, which is made of really thick, tough glass. Uh, but someone kicks it and it lands exactly the wrong spot against some hard object, and it breaks. Was the glass fragile? So there are no answers to those questions. Unfortunately, that is, I think, though, I, uh, dispositions generally are going to involve over and over again that kind of vagueness problem. And the disposition of a promisor to acquire a disposition to perform the promise is going to be a vagueness case. Um, but if it was not within the non-problematic core rather than in the penumbra of problematic cases, the institution of promising wouldn't survive. So it has to be usually successful and usually have all the right characteristics. And, and then the, you may fail to have the right characteristics for different reasons. 
One reason is that it may be illegal to make certain kinds of promises in a given society. Um, and so if you use those words, then even though you want to do the thing, and you say you'll do the thing, and the other person agrees, it turns out that you just did something illegal. And then you didn't really promise in some sense. Well, you can understand what sense that didn't really uh, implies. And that's part of the theory, too, that natural core obligation can be modified by legal um, adjustments. Uh, so, for instance, uh, it, it, in some cultures, minors cannot sign contracts. All right, so let's. Uh, so, this is not an account of what an obligation is, but I think this gets, gets us close to the core of understanding what an obligation is. And the, 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 the real nub of this is that in a society in which there was not a widespread disposition to sanction non performance, there would be no such thing as obligation. Uh, and I think also it goes on this side too. If there, if there was a society in which people were involved in a widespread use of I promise, which did not go hand in hand with the disposition to perform, then that society would not have the institution of promising, even though they had the words. Um, all right. So I'm just repeating now what I said before. This is a list of different kinds of sanctions. I think we, we need a long list of different kinds of sanctions, which would include gossiping, it would include avoiding, it would include raising your eyebrow, uh, uh, and so on. Now, Reed gets some of this right too. So he sees language not just as this clean digital string of words affair, but as involving modulations of the voice, gestures, and features, um, sometimes doing this, I imagine, uh, spitting, whatever they did in Scotland in those days. Um, so, where speech is natural, it will be ex an exercise not of the voice and lungs only, but of all the muscles of the body, like that of dumb people and savages. Um, so... Then, the, my idea is that the sanctions, sneering and so on, a losing face is probably in some cultures the most important sanction. If you break a promise in Japan, then that's probably it's seven generations of, uh, of loss of face in both directions. All right, now, I have to read, uh, Peirce uh, said some vaguely interesting things, but Adolf Reinach was the person who really invented speech act theory in 1913. Um, he was developing a, 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 an ontology of legal phenomena such as contract as part of a general ontology of social interaction in a, in a book called The A Priori Foundations of the Civil Law, which is mainly about promises. Um, now, it, and he anticipates all of the things which, or many of the things which Austin and Searle in England in the 1950s and thereafter were saying about speech acts. It's just that for Reinach, the background in the law was much more important and the ontology was much more important, where Austin and Searle were doing the philosophy of language. And so they were looking at the linguistic features of speech acts much more than they were looking at the ontological features. So, these are examples of speech acts. Um, they are acts. So, the, the, the term act is going to be very important. So, there are acts of the mind, thinking, deciding. And then there are acts which involve speaking, promising, congratulating. And what, we want, what we're going to want in the end is an ontology of acts. Document acts, for instance. Uh, and Reinach produces a typology of acts. So Reinach was a student uh, of Husserl, so he was a phenomenologist. He was basically Husserl's law person. Reinach did the phenomenology of law. And Reinach's typology starts with spontaneous acts like deciding, um, not acts of feeling a pain, that they are pass not feeling a pain which is a passive experience, but an active use of the mind 
uh, for instance, to make a decision. Um, now, this, we can make a decision verbally. I, if, if someone says to me, well, will you come? Then you say yes. And that would be a spontaneous act of deciding, which is expressed. So the act of speaking and the act of deciding and the mental part are all one. So the my, mental and the link external are fused together. But I didn't need to say yes. So I could decide to come and say nothing. So the deciding doesn't essentially involve the use of language, utter, public utterance. It's an accidental fact that I decided and expressed my decision simultaneously with deciding. Um, now then, Reinach distinguishes between self-directable acts, and now we get to promise, and non-self-directable acts. So he says that love, hate, and fear are self-directable. You can be afraid of yourself. Uh, you can certainly love yourself. Um, but that commanding, requesting, and we won't talk about promising for the moment, but commanding and requesting are non-self-directable. Now, do you agree with that? Okay, well. Um, now, social acts... And Reinach uses the same technical term as Reed used earlier. He defines Reinach as non-self-directable external spontaneous acts. Plus, they are acts which are in need of uptake. So the other person has to register what you said. So I can issue all the commands I like verbally, but the, I, I need to have people that I can tell what to do who are under my authority who hear my command, or read it, and register the command. Send me an email confirming receipt. Um, so a command is, making a command is a non-self-directable, external, spontaneous act in need of uptake. That sounds as if it might be overcomplicated, but in fact, it works uh, very crisply, I believe. And then he talks about it. Uh, requesting and so on are the same. Warning. And so there are linguistic components to every social act, and then there are mental components. So if you inform somebody of something, the mental component of conviction, you have to believe what you're saying, otherwise it's not an informing. If you're asking a question, then you have to be in a state of uncertainty or lack of knowledge. Uh, if you're requesting something, you have to want or wish for the thing you're requesting if you're really requesting something. He says. And he's right. Um, and then commanding, promising, and enactment, he says, all rest on the presence of will. So if you promise something, then you have to will that that something be performed. You also have to believe that it will be in the benefit, to the benefit of the promisee that you perform it. Um, so, envy doesn't depend on uptake. Forgiveness doesn't depend on uptake. You can forgive somebody even after they're dead. Um, but commanding depends on uptake. Now, enactment is an, is an interesting one because that's where we get the beginnings of an ontology of law. So, Reinach was a German... Uh, he, he didn't live very long. He died in the First World War at the age of 34. I think. Um, he was interested in the German civil law code, the Bürgerliches Gesetzbuch. And paragraph one of the Bürgerliches Gesetzbuch says, Die Rechtsfähigkeit des Menschen beginnt mit der Vollendung der Geburt. Which means that. And Reiner says, this is not any sort of judgment. So you're not expressing a truth when you say this. You are creating, you are enacting the world. That sounds a bit Heideggerian. But because the first paragraph of the German Civil Code says this, something called Rechtsfähigkeit, which is all one word in German, the ability of a sub to be a subject of rights or law, German uses the word Recht for both of those things. Um, Rechtsfähigkeit is created. 
by that speech act, or document act, as it happens, because this was a document. Now, this is ontological fisundity. Just writing this thing down and having it pass as the law creates a new thing called Rechtsfähigkeit. And it start, everyone has it, but only after they were born. Uh, ontological fertility. So if you see that Mary is swimming, then this gives rise to a conviction. That's a mental state that exists in virtue of the mental act of seeing that, such and so. And promising, as we've already seen, gives rise to claim and obligation. Commitment to a plan gives rise to a disposition to realize the plan. So these are all examples of ontological fisundity, um, which Reinach documents. Um, now, assertion, uh, we can draw a picture here. So an assertion is a linguistic act which rests on a conviction which is mutually dependent upon some act of apprehending something in the world. The act is directed towards that something which is a state of affairs. It's the act of some subject and the act itself depends upon some perceptual act. So you see Mary swimming, you apprehend that Mary, that Mary is swimming, you acquire the conviction and then you, have, you make an assertion which is founded on that. And all of these things happen simultaneously. And they all happen to the same subject, and they're all directed towards a certain state of affairs, which is in the world if you're lucky. All right, now we can look at the promise. So again, we have a subject which has the promiser role, so we should really write out subject, promiser role, one-sided dependence. The promise sing is a process which has three parts which are fused together um, to some degree. Uh, there is an act of speaking and an act of registering, which are the two most important parts, and both of them have the same content, which is to do F, where F is something that the promiseur will do uh, if he performs on the promise, and which is to the benefit of the promise. And we have here a case of three-sided mutual dependence. So you can't have an act of speaking, which is an act of promising, without there being a, a simultaneous act of registering, and without those two sharing the same content. And now, this act of speaking, this act of promising, will bring about the existence of an obligation on the part of the promiser. So there should be a here, and a claim on the part of the promisee. So this is fissundity. Claim and obligation pop into existence because the promise has occurred. And uh, there is another dimension, which is the tendency to realize the content of disposition, but we'll come back to that. Now, there is a parallel phenomenon in the realm of planning. So a military commander is presented with a range of alternative plan specifications, he decides to realize the plan specified in plan specification number one, and thereby becomes committed to realizing that plan specification, which means he has a plan. Because commitment to a plan specification involves ontological fissundity, giving rise to the popping into existence of a plan in his head. And then that gives rise to a disposition to realize the plan, a tendency towards realization. But notice that at this stage, there is no obligation. The only obligation on this whiteboard is that you should not write in green ink on the whiteboard. Um, he gets the obligation only when he announces to the headquarters staff that he has made a commitment to realize plan number one from his alternative. Once he speaks, it becomes, he becomes obliged to realize the plan. And they become obliged to realize the plan. Also. All right. Now, Searle talked about felicity conditions. So I say I promise to do X to somebody. I have performed a promise. I am necessarily under the obligation to perform that promise. 
Searle says, only if certain felicity conditions are satisfied. Uh, so I must actually be making a promise rather than making a sham promise. And something similar applies to sham assertions, rhetorical questions, and so forth. Um, or it may be that I am performing the act in someone else's name. So I'm a salesman working for a company. I promise to the customer that the company will deliver. I am promising in the name of the company. So there's no disposition on my part to realize the content of the promise. The disposition will be on the part of the shipping office of the company. Or it could be that the promise has multiple addresses, or it could be that there, it's a conditional promise. So I promise that we will deliver if it doesn't snow, um, and so on. Uh, and, um, and there are se several other modifications. Some of them correspond to Searle's felicity conditions. A longer list of these modifications was put forward by Reinach, who first saw that we can have this understanding of deviations from the canonical promise and thereby understand different kinds of social phenomena, such as lying, in terms of how things are supposed to go. So lying is not just telling, lying is not just saying something which is false. You can say something which is false without lying, and you can say something which is true and be lying. All right, and then there, there are individual social acts which involve just one person, uh, but then there are collective social acts which involve multiple people. Um, and some social media is not necessarily a matter of social acts. So you could use Facebook just as a diary. So the, the, the phenomenon of writing a diary can be a phenomenon which is being done as a social act because you want people to read it or it can be done as a private act because you want to keep a personal record. Now, the J.L. Austin was the, the inventor of speech act theory uh, in the English sense. Um, so he noticed that promising is something radically different from solitary acts like hoping and intending. So to promise that you'll do X is not to intend to do X. It's not a strong intended. Rather, when I say I promise, I have not merely announced my intention, but by performing this ritual, I have staked my reputation in a new way. So the sanction is very often a sanction which will impinge upon one's reputation. And so reputation is an important element in the ontology of social reality. Um, And then so Austin gets the sanction point also here. So the speech act of guaranteeing. So I guarantee that this thing will work or I'll be there on time. Uh, and I, I don't perform, then I am liable to be rounded on by others. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll beat me up with basket, baseball. Wait, baseball bats? Just checking. Uh, it, but they will giggle when you arrive in the room or something. And then there's John Searle, who was the, uh, the a student of Austin's, who um, is an American gentleman. Um, he's still alive. Um, so, ontological fecundity, when you perform a speech act, then you create certain institutional facts, he says. He denies that this is to be understood in ontological terms when you pressed him, but he wrote in, in what looks like ontological fecundity language. Uh, so, institutional facts exist, more ontological language, because we are able to treat the world and each other in certain very special ways. Um, so, examples of these institutions are money, property, marriage, government. So, languages we talked about earlier already in and of themselves are tied to obligations. So, the, the, we have this gigantic aggregate of competences of all the speakers of the language.
But then there are core speakers of the language. Mothers, for instance, school teachers, dictionary compilers, terminologists even. And these people have dispositions to monitor and evoke claims and to blame, shame, and punish when, either directly or indirectly, when fellow language users use language incorrectly. And that can mean many different kinds of incorrect. So, the, not every commun linguistic community has these things. Although I think every, all of them have mothers. Um, and the mothers are going to play a role um, linguistically. Um, one assumes that you couldn't have a language unless you had something like the existence of people who are correcting other people, schooling other people, grooming other people to speak correctly. Now, I talked about linguistic competencies and I gave a list. And uh, this list now must include the, this, these kinds of dispositions to monitor other people's uses of language, and to blame them if they use it correctly, incorrectly. Now, not everyone does that. I have a tendency to do that. Um, then I'm a teacher. But linguistic competence must, I believe, involve the existence of at least some subset of the population who have this disposition. And then these competencies must also dispositions to use language to achieve extra linguistic benefits, which means requesting appropriately, begging appropriately, uh, commanding, pleading, and so on. Uh, and also the disposition to use, use language to achieve extra linguistic benefits for others, for instance, by promising um, and so forth. So I don't think we need to go into any more detail about that. So how is ontological fissandity possible? Um, well, you can read that. Uh, you can look at the slide. All right, now what we, are, um, what we are going to need to do, not today, um, is to build an ontology of acts. And the two main kinds of acts are going to be mental acts and physical acts. Sub -kind, so, and fused acts. So speaking is a physical act which is fused with a mental act. Unless you're a parrot or a robot. Um, and then there will be certain special kinds of acts which are social acts. There will be certain special kinds of social acts which are speech acts. And there will be certain special kinds of social acts which are like speech acts, but which involve documents. And obligation is going to play a role, for, at least for all of these, um, and probably for, uh, it will already uh, make itself felt here. And so the question again is, what is an obligation? So now I'm going to try and do that job. So most of this we've seen. So... The semi-ritualized event of speaking we call a promise gives rise to two mutually correlated states of claim and obligation. It also gives rise to a tendency towards realization. It also gives rise to an initial tendency on the part of the promiseur to realize the content of the promise in the canonical case and a terminal tendency towards blaming and shaming in the case of non- or late performance uh, by the promisee, on the part of the promisee. So the promisee has to know about the act of promising in order to have this terminal tendency. And this terminal tendency has to be such that it is associated with a widespread disposition on the part of the wider society to which the promiser and promisee belong, either institutionally, if this is a legally binding promise or an economically uh, documented contract. Uh, so there may be institutional sanction mechanisms like police, uh, or it may just be on the level of gossip, or it may be that you have some friends who have baseball bats. Um, and the claim exists because 
this twofold terminal tendency on the part of both the promisee and on the part of the wider society to which both the promiser and promisee belong towards blaming and shaming in case of non-performance. The obligation exists. To say that the obligation exists means that the, and I haven't documented this yet to anything like my own satisfaction, the obligation exists because the promisor uses language in a way which is tuned to the existence of this sanction system and that means they use language in such a way that they are using language in order to get the maximum benefit with, while at the same time avoiding any sanction. So they want to get benefit by making a promise. They have some interest in making a promise, even though the promise is to the benefit of the promisee. But they know that making a promise puts them at risk of sanction. And so they only make a promise if they are willing to fulfill the promise, because if they don't fulfill the promise, they'll get sanctioned. And that's why when they make the promise, there comes into existence a tendency towards realization. So that's roughly the story. Yeah. Um, sorry, I think I'm sympathetic. Like Can I borrow somebody's pen? Uh, I think I'm more or less sympathetic to this account, but um, I'm wondering about cases where there are obligations and claims which don't arise from these sorts of social rituals of promising. So my obligation is stop and regulate, my obligation to try to speed limit, my obligation to seatbelt. I don't to There seems to be there is a kind of uh, the obligation is there. There's a claim on my behavior in some way. There's expectation from the society that I do this. There's try to sanction. I'm aware of that psychologically. It, it convinces me to stop at red lights even if there's no one around. Um, so in that way, it seems like the particular social ritual, the act of speaking, the use of language seem extraneous to the actual. Like, what's you want to cool. take out your driver's license? Uh, sure. <laughs> I mean, what a, I mean, again, that's... Just look at your driver's license. Tell me if there's a signature on it. Uh, yes, there's a signature. Okay, what, what does it say? The signature? Yeah, no, before the signature. <laughs> um, it doesn't say anything. Okay, I bet you that that was a form that you signed when you got your driver's license, which pr um, said you so promised to adhere to the... So, so let's say that I was driving without a license. I didn't get a license. I'm too young. I just got in the car and started. Yes, go on. Okay, this is so, sound so very me, I mean, it seems to me in that case, right, like I still, there, there's still a claim being made on me. Stop at red lights, we'll sanction you if you don't. We're at the speed limit. Oh, and by the way, get a license. Uh, all, all that. Uh, so I don't think, I, so I agree with what you're so, saying. So I, I don't think that it makes what I've said wrong. What I'm no, saying no, is I, that there is this core obligation. The core obligation is brought into existence by some kind of speech act or document act. In, your, in the driver's license case, you signed a document. Uh, now, the, something which is a modification of core obligation comes into existence whenever you... Um, I, I'm just thinking this through now, so, so I, may, I may delete this sentence, but whenever you get into a car and start driving, providing you are so of... of reasonable age and intelligence, and you know what driving means, you know what a road is, you know what traffic signs mean to some degree, then it seems to me there is a, a, an obligation to follow the... Tr no, right, I, I think so too. Um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not... Anyway, go on. You no, I mean, so other, other sorts of examples. Like, I, I never, but that's not a, I, that I doesn't I contradict that anything still, that I said. Right, it doesn't... I, I don't think it contradicts it. I think... Um, all it would show is that in this model, there are some pieces which are not essential. They're not, they're not at the core of what an obligation is. Because in this particular case, the obligation comes about because of doing an act of promising. But there are plenty of cases where there's no promise made, there's no speech act, I didn't say I promised to do this, I didn't say I would. But there's just a claim out there in the society, a claim on my behavior, and the threat of sanction. Like, there's, I would be, I, I'm under a threat of being blamed, shamed, and punished if I decide to just push Francesco out of his chair or something, knock him over, or steal 
of stuff from Amazon. I never said I wouldn't do this, but I'm under threat of sanction uh, if I were to try to steal you know, his laptop in his office. Or, you know, I don't, I don't want to spill over into moral cases. I just mean that it seems as though there's the same structure there, but there, there doesn't necessarily have to be the, the ritual, the promising. That's a, okay, that's a case. Good, that's, a kind, good. that's a kind of, of case where you have this. Um, but it's not necessary in lots of cases. Okay, so let, let, let me... Um, again, extemporize for a minute. So we'll go back to the, the terminology of the niche, the environmental niche in which we all um, do our driving behavior, for instance. Then the niche is made of roads with signs and so forth. And it's made also of the potential for there being police cars behind every tree. It's all, it also contains drivers who get angry when people drive badly. Um, not necessarily with guns, um, but in some countries they often have guns. Um, now, when you dip your toe into that water, then you're dipping your toe not just into a, a, an environment made of concrete and paint and poles with signs on them, but into an environment which is shaped by the existence of the police with an awareness of the obligations under which most of the traffic participants are certainly under, and they are going to be assuming that all of them are, because that will, will they don't know who the illegal drivers are out there. And so they're going to, this, this can't be the correct account of the law, but we can tidy up the details later. So there is a niche. Anyone who dips their toe in the niche is under obligations because of the policemen behind the trees. Now, Let's consider another, another somewhat analogous case, which is where I started. I said I was not going to deal with the obligation of parents to bring up their children appropriately. So some people believe that uh, parents have obligations to... In fact, it's, it's, it's built in the law that there are such obligations, but leave that aside. I can deal with the legal obligations that parents have to their children. Some people say that parents have ethical obligations to their children. You are in danger of being misinterpreted by me, I hope it's misinterpreted, of saying that the, the uh, alien traffic participant is obliged to drive safely for the same kind of ethical reason. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not trying to, to go there. I'm not trying to appeal to some separate moral obligation that they have. Um, my point was just that... Um, I mean, so I, I think I'm more in agreement with the bit that if you're going out there, you're driving, you're getting on the road, of course, you know about the laws, you know about the people behind trees and things like that, right? I'm not exactly sure that that's strictly necessary for the society to blame, shame, and punish you for breaking a law you're not aware of, right? Um, but, uh, but in any case, I don't see in any of those instances a case where someone is saying, I promised to do this, and that's what creates the obligation. Or that's what allows the society to rightly blame, punish, or shame. You never, you never made that, that kind of promise, but you're under that same obligation. Um, so I accept that the criticism that I need to give an account of alien traffic participants and all the other similar examples, uh, since it seems very tempting to um, assume that they, too, are obliged to follow the traffic law. Uh, so let me, let me give you an analogy um, which exposes what might be a weakness in your position. Let's suppose that you live in uh, some part of uh, 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 Grand Island or somewhere where there are lots of mafiosi. Um, and you want to frequent a bar where it, it, which is known to be a haunt of mafiosi. And anyone who goes into that bar has to behave in certain ways. And so you do behave in those ways. So you don't look at certain people too long and whatever it is that you need to do. You, you, behave, you behave appropriately. But I don't think you're obliged to behave appropriately. You're just afraid of being shot. 
And similarly, we might say the alien traffic participant is not under the obligation to follow the traffic laws. He's just uh, afraid of being caught and punished. Right, so I'm not sure there is anything more to that in the alien case. I'm also not sure there's more to that in the normal human case when it comes to driving. Uh, in Italy, uh, things are different. <laughs> um, so it's the, it's the most dangerous thing to drive on green in Italy. So, <laughs> um, So there are uh, reductionistic uh, interpretations of obligation afoot, that following obligations is just behaving in such a way that you avoid punishment. I am, um, uh, and I, I think actually uh, John Searle might be attracted by such reductionistic views because he doesn't really like the idea that there are institutional facts which are different from physical facts. They're just pretend facts. So he thinks money is a matter of fantasy. I mean, so he thinks money does miniature. not exist. In your mafiosi. You have a miniature sort of social institution going on right there. Yeah. And I'm not sure exactly what the difference is in kind between that and the... I mean, there, okay. there, there could be an argument about the legitimacy of the law, or like okay. the legitimacy so, of the rules or something like that. Well, the government has a legitimate power, yeah. the mafia's and they don't, but I, that, I'm not sure how that's... Would work so out. let's try and follow this through. So there are two ways in which you can go into the bar in Grand Island. One way is you go in there and you say, you're warned by your friends. If you go there... You're obliged to behave in such a way. And you have an ontology of obligation, which means that you go in there and you adopt the appropriate obligedness, um, whatever that means. That's one alternative. The other alternative is that you go in there and you deliberately behave so that they won't punish you. So you don't feel under any obligation. You just follow a strategy of behaving in a way which you think will be safe. Now, behaviorally, there could be no difference between those. I think that I prefer the second case, all right? So you, you, you're not under any obligation, you just behave strategically. <coughs> now let's just, um, uh, see if we can do that for a, a more um, legitimate social institution. So you go into a bar and you don't throw your glassware onto the floor every five minutes. I'm not sure where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> Are you failing to throw your glassware on the floor because you know that patrons of this bar are obliged not to throw their glassware? Or are you doing it because you're behaving strategically and you want, want to avoid it? I think there that the obligation uh, mode is actually much more tempting than the strategic mode. I, maybe that's just because it's a very obscure so, so example. So I, like I like this example because it's something where I didn't go in and sign a paper that said, by, by the way, I will yeah. not throw glasses on the yeah. floor. Yeah, but, but, I, but yeah. actually, but all, the, you'll see somewhere in the bar there will be a notice that says, all the people in this bar are subject to paragraph 4363 in New York State. Mm -hmm. Drunkenness occurs all the time. I thought I was just doing it for the health. Uh, um, so, in that case, I, I guess what I'm just wondering is what what is there in that case, in the obligation case, that's not there when I am doing it for strategic reasons? If there was no promise that I would do. What else is? Hidden oh, there? I think I think that in um, civilized society, every uh, commercial enterprise is associated with a very detailed legal architecture which di dictates that anyone who walks through the door is subject to certain obligations and anyone behind the, the counter is subject to uh, another set of obligations. So they have to bake you a wedding cake if you ask nicely, that kind of thing. I'm just finding myself back around at the moment. So I think with the mafiosi, we are much more inclined to take the strategic interpretation, where with the legal drinking establishment, we're much more inclined to take the obligation uh, interpretation, and that conforms exactly to the theory I'm defending. I think that means you lose. Yeah? Yeah.
Are, are you suggesting that there will always be like a universal answer to this? I mean, what I'm getting at is that it seems like there's a lot of different people in this world that has very different reasons to act in certain ways. Um, let's just say. So I believe, on the contrary, that the hunt for a universal answer would be quite wrong. So my approach is like the picture of the language, the English language in the United States, where some people say crawdad and some people say crayfish. So there's no one account. It's one thing called the, the English language, but there's, there are many, many differences between the ways people speak the English language in different parts. I wouldn't want to have that be just one set of obligations. If you want to speak English, you have to speak like this. I want to do justice to that kind of variability. Now, there may be some people in some parts of the English-speaking world who are speaking completely differently, and, and maybe they're not making any sense even to themselves, but they're not the counterexample because they're not part of the English-speaking community. But it just seemed like in the, in the mob case, the bar, yeah. that there are people, in fact, maybe a lot of people in this world, who couldn't care less about the punishment, and who just act I think that, and that, that, I didn't emphasize this, so I emphasize that the disposition to blame and shame may be very weak, and may even be absent in some parts, but it could be absent everywhere, because if it was, the, the institution of obligation and promise wouldn't have arisen. So I, I will make the same emphasis over here. There are many people who, at least for some periods of their life, go around making promises without any intention to perform, but those people, either they will need to keep moving house regularly to find more, um, what's the word? Um, what's the target of a confidence trickster? Mark. A mark. mark. More marks. They, they keep moving. Or they will grow out of their tendency to uh, make sham promises. It's a survival Yep. I have a simple question. So yep. uh, when I walk into the bar, not the mafia, just the regular bar, and they have their law code or whatever on the wall, am I implicitly promising to uh, obey that law? No, I, the, I've talked a lot about promising. <laughs> promising is just one of a whole range of obligation-generating acts. And one obligation-generating act is walking into a commercial establishment. Another obligation-generating act is buying a railway ticket or buying a, a Super Bowl ticket. Um, and it, it create, the buying a, a, a symphony performance ticket creates obligations in both directions. When you buy the ticket, the symphony hall is obliged to deliver on the performance that you bought a ticket for, are or to these, recompense you. Are all these species linked by uh, some act of consenting in some way? Or, or can some of them be not I think that the, so the act of registering means not just that you hear it and you understand it, but also that you approve it. And so to the extent that the act of registering is a pretty common feature in these structures, um, then... I think that consent will indeed be a pretty common feature uh, of those structures also. And um, uh, I would say that the consent too goes in both directions. So when you buy the ticket, you consent to behaving yourself in the theater or the concert hall. And the, um, the, the concert hall managers cons consent to you having you there. They enable you to be sold a ticket by one of their representatives who was making promises on their behalf. And you're not um, permitting yourself to consent always being there? Obligation Don't know. I haven't thought that through. So I think what, what, what I am committing myself to here is that there is a, 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 always a function here of the sanction process. Uh, so if the manager of the concert hall uh, 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 obliges himself to perform on the contract, which is the ticket, and fails repeatedly to actually deliver music or deliver good music or deliver music in a 
air-conditioned environment and so on, he will lose customers and go out of business. And so there is a kind of weeding out process of the sham and the sloppy and the, the, the ineffective provi providers of uh, things that promising promises to do, which is why the core obligation case will always be in the equilibrium in the majority of cases. And the, mar the few people who are confidence trickers will always be in the minority. So conf being a confidence trickster is not a safe occupation. Yeah? So uh, just now you are teaching, you give an example about the question of what's the time. Uh, so uh, uh, actually uh, the sentence most of the time have different meaning in different contexts. Uh, it may mean uh, I'm in a hurry, I'm going to leave. Uh, it may mean um, uh, we have talked about uh, uh, this uh, thing in one hour, I don't want to talk with this guy anymore. Uh, so in many cases, what I say that uh, it doesn't equal to uh, what I mean in my mind. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So, um, how to uh, use uh, ontological uh, theory to explain it? So, that, let's take a, a very simple case. You see a traffic sign on the road which says 50. It's 5 0. Now, what does that mean? 50 pints of Guinness? Um, 50 miles to Texas? No, it means better drive not much over 50. Otherwise, you'll get fined if the policeman catches you, and a whole range of things like that. So, of course, the, the, the language that we use is, and I think I gave even lists of some of these additional effects, but it involves additional effects, and it involves additional contextually uh, available information, which may only be available to one party. So if you say, what's the time, because you want an excuse to leave, because you suddenly remember that you're late for your meeting, then the speaker need not know that. You would still achieve your effect. So I agree that, that linguistic communication involves all kinds of ellipses. And uh, many of the effects that we're talking about are achieved because of those ellipses, including the traffic signs. So it would be actually ineffective if traffic signs expressed in full what they meant. Um, so this might be getting past the scope of the issue, but um, so feel free to just disregard the question, I guess. Um, but what happens when we don't have um, people who are who who don't consent to the obligation claim structure, um, but actively participate in um, sort of the I forget the term you use, but the, the the sort of initiating conditions, right? Buying the ticket, walking to the restaurant, whatever. Um, they're doing it to subvert the obligation claim. I'm thinking of like protesters who want, you know, protesters who schedule a sit-in in, in a white-only restaurant yeah. with explicit white-only signs, and it's totally backed up by legal code. Um, Good. So, the, remember the big diagram or the big map of English use of crawdaddy and so forth. Now. The crawdaddy people may decide that they want people in neighboring states to say crawdaddy also. And so they gradually send their children to these neighboring states, and the, the children have babies, all of them say crawdaddy, and eventually they would succeed in uh, changing the terms of debate in the next state. Now, something similar can happen with regard to other kinds of obligations. So, and I think saying crawdad rather than crayfish is an obligation that people have in certain uh, bars. And I think I would probably be proved right if I tried to say crayfish in certain bars where I'm supposed to say crawdad. Um, the same thing applies to the more politically sensitive obligations that people are under. Um, and the, the, the history of the ways in which legal codes change by protests and so forth proves that. I don't think your question is out of bounds at all. I think I not only did I not claim that there was a universal system of obligations, I also didn't claim that there was a permanent system of obligations. Sure. This is based on an evolutionary approach to the way populations change. So, so are the protesters obligated or not? So 
th this is a very interesting um, edge case for ontological sure. presumity. So when the um, authors of the Declaration of Independence wrote the Declaration of Independence, there was no United States to be the author of that Declaration of Independence. They did not have the legal right, uh, the permission, uh, they were behaving illegally, as we well know. But, by hook or by crook, they succeeded in persuading the kind gentlemen British that we would let them, <laughs> they would let them have their show. And now it, it's all, it's, the show is on the road. <laughs> Are you are you further committed to do some extra reduction? Uh, this whole view here is tied to the actual possibility of caring of some, let's just say, some emotional entity. Oh, absolutely. So that there can only be sanctioned if there is emotion and negative emotion which causes resistance to performing. So there will be acts. a further. Oh, absolutely. Of yeah, yeah. And when I say mental acts and physical acts at the top of this ontological hierarchy. A sub-kind of mental act is emotion act, and there is an ontology of emotions, which I think you know about. Yeah. So that part we've already built. That's probably the best part. <laughs> yeah? This is sort of related to your next question. So I'm wondering if obligations, they can be stronger and weaker, right? Oh, I, absolutely. Yeah. But is that a function of the mutual dependence of the dispositions and hearing in the obligator and the obligee? I think that there will be no algorithm. Uh, so you could have somebody who makes promises in a society which is very pernickety about sanctioning promise breakers, but who has a very weak disposition to realize a promise because he's a bit of a sloppy character. Or you could have a society in which the people don't care much. They care somewhat, but they don't care much about promise breakers. But there are nonetheless individuals in that society have, who have strong dispositions to perform on their promise. You think so, it therefore follows that there are different degrees of obligation in those different societies? I don't know whether there is mileage to be gained out of uh, a theory of degrees of obligation. I haven't. So that I don't know. I don't like. Um, I don't know. I don't want to say. Anything. Because we have a tendency to talk that way, but it would it would get confusing quickly because we think of the strengths of obligations as being considerations that count in favor of them. Whereas, you know, I could be with a mafiosi uh, who would kill me for violating some obligation, and that seems like a stronger disposition they have to shame and monitor than society's general uh, disposition to put me in jail for five years for the same act. But I wouldn't want to say that I have, therefore, a stronger obligation to keep quiet. I would agree. So right? I think it's so just, it's hard, it's going to be hard to get a linear order. You can say this obligation is stronger than that one and understand the reasons for it. So if this obligation is the obligation to save, um, oh, I don't want to. I don't want to come. So any more questions? Yeah. You have to speak up. It's a question about the concept of modification to implies about language. Yes. Depending on living yeah. humans. So ancient languages are not languages? Like where the theory of anymore? the theory which identifies a language as the sum total of all the competencies of speakers of a language implies that languages can go extinct. So there are extinct languages, like there are extinct organism species. Now we can study those ex extinct languages. We may even learn to speak those extinct. People learn to speak Hebrew again after Hebrew went extinct. So we can re we can re-engineer extinct languages. Um, and I think that that's a nice consequence of the view. Um, so there are two kinds of dead languages, those that we, we are able to reproduce and understand and then learn to speak, 
and maybe even re-engineer into existence, and those which are just dead. They're in, all the speakers are gone and they didn't have writing. So we can't possibly recreate them. Final question. So this is back to my obligations. So, uh, so I've worked a lot in metaethics on non-cognitism. In metaethics, people think about things like obligations and they're very confusing. Right? So some people go, well, let's forget about what an obligation is. Let's just look at what are people thinking when they yep. attribute obligations, yep. obligations to people, right? And non-cognitivism is the view that, well, there's something kind of performative, right? Yep. It's, it's not just people are saying something's there. They're performing something and they're saying, uh, here I am, I'm prepared yep. to blame uh, someone for not doing this, and so on and so forth. And I think this can resolve all the, a lot of these puzzles about, well, what does someone have an obligation to follow an unjust law, right? Our intuitions track the idea that we're performing something when we uh, when we say that people have obligations. Um, so I haven't checked the non-cognitive view in, in some ways, and uh, do you think that that can be squared with this in any way, or so, do you think these are not on the same... No, I think that, that there is certainly this non-cognitivist use of obligation and similar language. So we can use the obligation language in this performative, uh, non-cognitivist one outcome which I would be perfectly happy with would be that to rewrite everything I've said but never going outside the scope of this non-cognitivist performative use. Uh, and you get exactly the same results. It's just that instead of saying there are obligations, we say there is obligation talk which is just non-performative, non-cognitive use of language. I wouldn't object to that outcome. I would, I would declare victory. Um, where I would be in a, where, where I would be um, uh, less satisfied would be if you could show, because of this view that you describe, that there are things which I cannot account for, which you can account for on the non-cognitive performance view. So that would interest me, uh, because this is put forward as an empirical um, approach. I want it to be as testable as possible. All right, so... We will meet again uh, next week, and anyone who, who wants to talk to me about the um, topics for their uh, uh, presentations can start sending me proposals, or we can meet again. We can meet at 12.15 in my office next week. This is a friendly comment, not a bar. Um, so there have been some recent work on... Um, experimental philosophy work on the principle of thought implies can. Yes. And one of these was recently published in the Journal of Cognition, but the vignette they use is specifically about promises. Yeah. And I think it plays in your favor. So, so you want to send it to me? I can send it to you. But what, what they find is that blame attributions predict whether or not you think a promiser is obligated, not whether or not they had an ability. So the, the ability talk 